Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm John Pendleton. I'm not the uh, I'm not Carly in the picture there. Uh, Carly's not with us today. Normally, she's our host and would uh, kind of field some of the questions and then get them over to me. So it's just me today. Not a big deal. Uh, if you do have a question, uh, there's a little question button there on your control panel. Uh, just type out your question. It'll pop up on my screen and uh, I'll get to it um, when I get maybe to a stopping point or halfway through or something like that. But uh, but we will cover basically the heat of extraction, heat of rejection today. Uh, that's a pretty important uh, step in troubleshooting a geothermal unit. So don't ever hesitate to ask a question or let me know if I'm going too fast, if I need to back up or anything. Uh, you know, I do this on a regular basis, so it's like second nature to me. And uh, sometimes I can kind of go a little fast. So if I do, you know, ask me to slow down or uh, um, rehash something. So uh, we will go ahead and get started. And I appreciate everyone joining today. Probably be here maybe uh, maybe about an hour or so. So it, it won't be super long. Here I am right here, a uh, little bald headed guy. I'm the uh, trainer at Intertech. I also do tech support as well. That's what I've done basically for the past uh, seven years with Intertech. And a little bit of background on me. I, I, you know, I came from the field. I was a service technician. Uh, I'm originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, and uh, worked on a lot of hospitals and commercial, large commercial jobs, uh, warehouses, things like that, doing service work. So before I came to Intertech. So um, again, I've been with Intertech for about seven years. They're a really good company to work for. And um, I enjoy doing these trainings. So if you ever need anything from me, if you have training requests that you would like, uh, either in person or webinars or videos or anything uh, training related, you can uh, call me. That's my direct line, that's 618-690-3275. Uh, or if you would like to talk to tech support, you can call the 664-5860 number and that'll go to the pool back in tech support. There's my email address as well. Uh, and you can also email training at intertechgo.com. And I receive those emails as well. Uh, Carly and I kind of handle that email account. So any training requests or anything, uh, you can send them to me personally, or you can go ahead and send it to the training website as well. So when we do heat of extraction, heat of rejection, uh, it's Basically, it's going to really show how the unit's performing without putting refrigerant gauges on the system. Uh, as you know, our systems are a sealed system, basically, and they have, they're pre-charged from the factory. So if you were to put your hoses on every time you went out there to check the refrigerant pressures, you're going to be taking some refrigerant out of the system. Over time, it could get low. And uh, so we don't want to put our gauges on if we don't have to. And that's what the heat of extraction heat of rejection calculation uh, will tell us. Basically, you're gonna need a water pressure gauge, and I would highly recommend a digital gauge, uh, especially when you get into the smaller flow rate pressure differences. Uh, they can get pretty small, like 1.2 or 2.3 pound pressure drop, and that's really hard to see on an analog gauge, especially because the pressures tend to bounce a little bit. So I would recommend a pressure gauge. We do sell a Dwyer gauge and we may have it on a, a picture coming up uh, and you can get it online, you can buy it from us. It doesn't really matter to me, but I would highly recommend the uh, digital pressure gauge. Uh, we need a thermometer that can go into a PT port or a pressure temperature port. Uh, I'd recommend digital on that as well. Uh, and then you'd have to have the manual for the unit. If you don't have a manual, you can always call tech support or go to our secure site and pull that up. Uh, I think you can also go to the Geo Comfort or the Hydrogen Module or the Techco uh, websites as well and pull up the the manuals for the newer units that we uh, that we do that we currently sell. Uh, and you can pull up the PDF of that and download it to your phone. Uh, but we will need the manual. If for some reason you can't get it, you can't download it. Definitely give us a call on tech support. Uh, we run this calculation numerous times daily, 
Uh, so it's not a big deal. If you can get us the numbers, we can look in the manual and, and figure it out for you pretty quick. Make sure we're always installing pressure temperature ports uh, in the source uh, water lines. It's, it's extremely important on a uh, pressurized system because we cannot we can't see how many GPMs are going through that system, so we have to do pressure drop in order to figure that out. Without PT ports, really the only way to check pressure drop or to check flow is to disconnect the water line on the outlet and drain it into a bucket and see how long it takes to fill it up. And that's not a really good way of going about doing it, especially on a pressurized system. So when in doubt, install PT ports. If you've got a water to water unit, make sure that you're installing those on the load side of uh, as well, so the source and the load, because we may need to check pressure drop and flow on that side as well. We recommend always running the unit in second stage and uh, and doing the calculation. In some of our manuals, we will have part load information, but I would always recommend second stage and turn the DD superheater off. The newer units, the YT unit has a little switch on the side of the control panel or a control box that you can just uh, turn the, the superheater off. But uh, um, if you don't have that switch, then you can uh, just disconnect the pump. As we go through here, there will be some uh, pictures and we'll kind of um, go through that here. Hang on one second. Oh. So first we need to understand the engineering data tables in the manual themselves. So we'll kind of look at the manual here and kind of go through some of the headings that are in the uh, spec manual. This is an 036, probably a XT unit or something, but most of our, or all of our charts are uh, look, look the same. The newer charts will have closer entering water temperatures. If you look over here to the left where it says EWT, that's entering water temperature, and that's on the source. So obviously we would look at the entering water temperature and kind of find what we need to, uh, our closest water temperature. If you were at 45 degree entering water temperature, we would probably want to use the 50 degree mark. We do have correction factors in the manual. Um, if these are a little bit of out of range that we can use, I don't really use the correction factors very often unless the calculation is way off and I need to you know, dig in a little bit deeper. But basically, entering water temperature is just that. You're gonna put your uh, thermometer into that pressure temperature port and check your entering water temperature. That's gonna give you your start. The next is your flow rate. It'll say GPM, and you can't just pick a flow rate. Be like, well, I'm moving nine GPM. We've got to use the pressure drop. So if you look, if you take a, a uh, pressure gauge, you're going to put it in the entering and leaving and you will get your pressure drop. But we're trying to figure out how many gallons a minute are moving through that heat exchanger. So we actually use the pressure drop and not the GPM. So we, that's why we've got to have this manual. There is no calculation or equation that I can give you that says if you multiply this times this times your pressure drop it's going to give you a GPM it doesn't really work that way every unit's different uh, they have different heat exchangers in them and so that's why it's so important to have the manual with you when you're doing this calculation because we've got to be able to take the pressure drop and convert that to GPM with the manual itself So basically, we're going to take our entering water pressure, and there's actually a DeWire gauge right there, uh, and we're going to take a pressure in, and we're going to take a pressure out. And one thing I do want to say is your pressure in 
should always be higher than your pressure out. If your pressure in is not higher than your pressure out, then it's possible that you have those lines reversed. And I don't, there's normally stickers on the unit that will tell you what the source in and source out is. But at the same time, I have seen a few instances where the sticker was just put wrong at the factory or for some reason they were hooked up backwards. The unit will still operate. It just won't have quite the performance that uh, it would in the normal path of flow. So if we take pressure in, pressure out and take the difference of that, that's going to give us our PSI, our PSI drop. We also have feet ahead. We don't really use the feet ahead. The feet ahead, the FT next to the WPD pressure drop in that column next to the PSI, that would be used if you're going to size a pump and you need to know what the pressure drop through the heat exchanger is. So if you need to size your uh, flow center, then you can use that feet ahead to figure out what size pump you may be. The next is EAT or entering air temperature. And we give you a 60, a 70, or an 80 on your, and that's return air temp. So basically what you're gonna do is you're gonna put a thermometer into your return air and get a temperature. Now, again, we have 60, 70, and 80. There are correction factors in the manual. This is a correction factor sheet. It's in the manual that will give a little bit more of different uh, entering air temperatures. And normally we rate these with an 80 degree return in cooling and 68 degree return in heating. So if you're outside of those ranges and your calculation doesn't come back quite right, then we can use this correction factor uh, when we figure out our heat of rejection or heat of extraction. Heating capacity, that's the total heating capacity of the unit. So heat of, uh, heating capacity will be lower than, or excuse me, higher than heat of extraction. And that's because basically what we're doing is the heat of extraction is the amount of heat that we're pulling out of the loop field or out of the ground or out of the well, whatever heat we're pulling out of there. We also have what's called heat of compression. So the compressor and the refrigerant circuit put off a certain amount of heat. Well, in heating mode, we can use that heat for the home. So if we have, let's say 30,000 BTUs of heating that we're pulling from the loop field, well, we're gonna tell you, we're also gonna pick up in this example, another 10,000 BTUs of heating from the refrigerant circuit. We're gonna pick that up and with the 30,000, and we're gonna output total heating capacity to the home at 40,000 BTUs. We can actually figure out the heat of compression. Uh, I'll, I can cover that more in some uh, startups and some troubleshooting stuff, but basically, if you take volts times amps, that equals watts. You take that and you multiply it times your I think it's uh, 3.4, and that will give you BTUs. So in the field, you can figure out how much output your heat of compression is doing. With that number, we can actually figure out the COP and the EERs of the unit of how efficient it's running. So if you ever have a homeowner that says, I'm getting high bills, this calculation right here is the first one that we're going to do to see what kind of COP or EER or the efficiency of the unit is going to be. As we go through this, I'll show you some of the COPs and the EERs. If you ever look really closely at the heat of extraction and the heat of rejection, your heat of rejection will always be higher than your heat of, or your heat of extraction. And that's because in heat of extraction, you're using that heat from the heat of compression in the home. And so you've got your heat of extraction plus your heat of, re or heat of compression, sending that into the home as your heating capacity. In cooling, you still have that heat of compression that you have to get rid of. 
So we pull heat from the home. We also pull heat from the refrigerant circuit, and then we dump all of that and reject that into the loop field. So basically all we're doing in heating or cooling is transferring heat from one place to the other. You know, in heating, we're pulling it from the ground and the compression and putting it into your home. In cooling, we're pulling it from your home and the refrigerant circuit and dumping that heat into the ground. So heat of extraction is just that, is pulling it out of the loop field. So that's heat of extraction. That's how much we can pull from the loop field. Leaving air temp, that's your supply air temperature. Normally we're somewhere around, uh, you know, a 20, 25 degree temperature difference, depending on loop field temperatures, things like that. But normally we're about a 20 to 25 degree split between your return air temp and your supply air temp. So we're just gonna uh, check leaving air temp on the uh, supply plenum and see what that temperature would be. Input, that's your uh, power. So that's basically your uh, heat of compression. Now it's in kilowatts, not in BTU. So you have to do a calculation to figure out what that is, but, uh, and we may go through that here in just a second. Coefficient of performance. In heating, we use COP, and in cooling, we use EER. So coefficient of performance and energy efficiency ratio. Now you may have heard on a standard air source heat pump, uh, SEER rating, which is a seasonal energy efficiency ratio. Uh, in a geothermal unit, we don't use SEER rating, we use a EER rating. You can actually figure out the COP by taking your energy delivered divided by your energy supplied. Now you're supplying the energy with your compressor. So that's your energy supplied. You're delivering 40,000 BTUs to the home. So that's the energy delivered. So you would take 40,000 BTUs divided by your uh, energy supplied, which is your 10,000 BTUs. And that would give us a 4.0 COP. So COP is BTU, BTUs an hour output divided by BTU an hour input. So we'll go through this little example here. Here's a little chart. Our kilowatts, well, I'm not really sure what happened there. Um, we would take that kilowatts and multiply that uh, and convert that to BTUs and then the BTUs output divided by our BTU input. Normally we're around a three and a half or so, three uh, COP, depending on entering water temperatures. So how do we perform the measurements and the calculations on heat of extraction, heat of rejection? It's what we're really here today for. Um, you know, if there's only one thing that you learn on any of our trainings, this is probably the most important. This is why I do this training more often than any others, because this is super important. It has to be done on every single job, any geothermal heat pump that you go out on, this needs to be done. Basically, when you start to do this calculation, you know it will tell you, hey, yes, I do have proper water flow, or no, I don't. So it basically starts you off where we need to find out first, We've got to establish that we have water flow and airflow within specifications. Airflow, I mean, you can walk to a register, you can feel it, you can look at your blower motor and you know hear it running. With water, in a perfect world, you shouldn't really hear the water flowing in the piping. Now, if you do, there could be air in it, but and you can't just feel the line and say, yeah, it's moving proper water flow. So we've got to be able to check. Again, before a system can properly be diagnosed or service, 
proper water flow and airflow must be established within specs. On the airflow, if you need to know what the airflow is and you have an ECM blower motor on it, you can look at the ECM board and it will flash one time for every 100 CFM. So then you can look at it and say, you can see, you can count the blinks and say, I've got a thousand CFM, that's right probably where I should be. When we check the electrical draw, we had a question when we're checking the COP and the kilowatts, we basically take an amp draw just on the compressor itself, uh, because that's the only portion that's really putting heat into the refrigerant circuit. So we would just take an amp draw and take uh, your volts. So you would check your volts at your contactor uh, and multiply that times your amps, and then that would give you your watts. These are the tools that we would recommend. Uh, now, I would not necessarily recommend the temperature probe that's the, the black and red one. It will work, but it's a little uh, wider, the, uh, the shaft of that thermometer, and sometimes it can get stuck in the pressure temperature ports, and then you end up pulling the head off, and you've got the head and the wires and the little metal piece is still stuck in the uh, PT port. We have this Cooper uh, uh, temperature probe here, and it has, you can see, it has a little tapered end on it, and it's thinner where it gets bigger. It's not quite as big as the thermometer right above it. So it'll go into those PT ports a lot easier. You will not need to put you know, channel locks onto it to rip it out. Uh, it works really well. And then this is the Dwyer digital pressure gauge. One real quick comment on the Dwyer gauge, if you order one uh, from Amazon or even from us, it does not come with that needle on it. So you will need to either have one, uh, you know, you've already got one, or we do have them at Intertech and you can order those um, uh, from us, but it doesn't come with the needle on it. It just comes as the pressure gauge. But again, this is a Dwyer that I would recommend and then this Cooper uh, thermometer. I use that Cooper thermometer quite a bit. Here are PT ports. They're showing these in the older uh, square little hose kit elbows. You can order hose kits with the PTs. They won't be installed in the fitting yet. There'll be a plug in there, but they will come with the hose kit. And I would recommend that you install those. They can be installed at the flow center or at the unit. It doesn't really matter to me, but make sure they're being installed. It's basically like a brass fitting with a neoprene plug in the middle of it. And that neoprene plug has a little X cut into it. So you can push the, the thermometer or the pressure gauge in there. And then when you pull it out, it'll seal that hole. Over time, you might see that um, they get a little weak and that's why there's a cap and that cap will seal it up. So if they start to drip a little bit, just make sure you put that cap back on <clears throat> or like on a pressurized system, you could lose your pressure in your system. On non-pressurized flow center, reading of the GPM isn't as accurate now with two NP series flow centers for GeoFlow, those will be okay checking pressure drop on. It's the old QTs uh, that didn't really have correct pressure drop. So you would have to use a flow meter tool to set your flow. And once you set it, it shouldn't change, uh, but you would have to use the flow meter tool. Pressurized system, definitely use pressure drop. There's a little opening on the top of the tank in a non-pressurized system. And there's a dip tube in the, in the non-pressurized flow center. Uh, has a PVC fitting on it, and you can hook your little uh, flow meter into that discharge and then dump back into the flow center, and that's how you would check 
uh, there's just like a slide on that sight glass of that flow meter tool and it'll just float to where your gpm is and then you can take a ball valve and kind of dial the flow in if you have too much flow or if you some of our pumps are a three speed you can change the speed on them I do not have a part number off the top of my head for the pressure gauge. <clears throat> if you send me an email, I can get you that part number. And the pressure range is zero to 100 uh, PSI. So heat of abstraction, heat of rejection formula. I'd recommend writing this down. Again, it is in our manuals. So uh, every manual will put it in there. But basically, TD is your temperature difference between your entering and leaving water temperature. So temperature difference times GPM. Again, we'll take our pressure drop and convert that to GPM using the pressure drop pressure drop table uh, in the unit or in the manual times our brine factor. Uh, brine factor, you can call that your antifreeze or your, uh, you know, what the weight of the water. Basically, just remember that we use 500 if you have an open loop or you're just using straight water. And we use 485 for any uh, water antifreeze mixture. So if you've, you've got methanol and water mixed or ethanol or propylene glycol, we're just gonna use 485. So we already have the brine factor number. The only numbers we have to get from the unit itself are the GPM and the temperature difference. Now, the heat of abstraction formula is no different than the heat of rejection formula. It's, we're just doing, we're moving heat to a different place we're either extracting it or rejecting it, but the calculation does not change. Makes it nice, you don't have to remember uh, a couple of different formulas. You just have to remember the one. This is actually a specific gravity chart or capacity factor of different types of antifreezes and water. And so you can see, you know, we tell you if you have straight water to use 500. The actual capacity factor of water is 501. So you could actually use 501 if you wanted, if you had water, but 500 is a lot easier to remember and it'll work out just fine for you. You know, and then you can see methanol at 20% is 490. Um, propylene glycol at 30% is 483. So a good round number is 485 for antifreeze. We're normally not gonna be quite as high as 30% propylene glycol, probably closer to 25%. Uh, that methanol will probably be right around 20, 22%. So that 485 will work just fine for us. Well, basically what we're trying to do when we add antifreeze to a system is to prevent freezing uh, on our non, on our non-design days when it gets really cold and our loop field drops. Uh, so we have antifreeze protection down to 15 degree freeze protection. On an open loop, we don't have to worry about that because the water temperature is always consistent. Uh, so um, we don't have to uh, worry about it freezing up. When you look at our manual, you can see the chart here. We list three flow rates, and we wanna let you know why we list three. Basically, the first flow rate here, now this is a YT048 two-stage unit. We're in full load. The first flow rate is the minimum flow rate for an open loop. So one and a half GPM is the minimum flow rate per ton on an open loop system. So this is being a four ton unit, 
uh, one and a half times four equals six. So six GPM is minimum flow rate on an open loop for a four ton unit. The second flow rate is minimum flow rate for a closed loop system. Excuse me. Minimum flow rate for a closed loop is 2.25 GPM per ton. So 2.25 2.25 times four is nine GPM. So nine GPM minimum flow rate for a four ton unit. The third flow rate is recommended flow rate for a closed loop, which is three GPM per ton. So three times four is 12. So 12 GPM recommended flow rate on a YTO 48 unit. So we have minimum flow rate for open loop, minimum flow rate for a closed loop, and recommended flow rate for a closed loop. If for some reason you have more flow than what you need, it's not the end of the world. As you slow down or speed up the water flow rate, it's going to affect your tenants. Obviously, the slower you run the water through the piping, the more time it's in contact with the pipe, so the more heat that's going to be either extracted or rejected. So like on an open loop, you know, we have a much higher temperature difference because we're running about half the flow. If we're running half the flow, you can figure we're probably should have double the temperature difference. So flow rate affects your heat transfer rate as well. You have too much flow, your pressure or your temperature temperature difference is going to be low. The unit's not going to run quite as efficient and you're probably going to be wasting a little bit of pumping watts, but that's not the end of the world. That's when we don't have enough flow, that's when we can run into some problems. So here's a flow rate example. Here again, we have a YTO48. We have entering water temperature of 30 degrees. Entering pressure of 40.8, and we're leaving at 36.6. So we just do the math on that. Actually, I think I did, did I think it's supposed to be 40, not 40.8, because that will give us a 3.4 pound pressure drop. So we can actually look here, entering water pressure of 40 PSI and leaving at 36.6, 3.4 pound pressure drop. So Entering water pressure minus leaving water pressure gives us pressure drop. So here is a, like a broke down version of that chart. We're at 30 degree entering water temperature. We're at 3.4 pound pressure drop. So we slide over and that tells us that we're moving seven GPM. Temperature difference. You guys are pretty probably pretty familiar with doing temperature difference uh, because you guys do it a lot on uh, supply and return air, um, things like that. So entering water temperature, let's say we have 36.8, leaving water temperature of 31.2. So we would just do the math. 36.8 minus 31.2 gives us a 5.6 degree temperature difference. So with those two calculations, we can go ahead and and do the calculation. Here we have an example of an XT unit high speed. So we're going to tell you that you have 12 GPM. Your temperature difference is 7.2. It's a closed loop, so we have antifreeze in the system. So we take 7.2 times 12 times 485, and that gives us a number. Now, don't just say, oh, that's our number, that's, we're good to go. We need to compare that back to the manual again. We were having to look at the XT-048 at 50 degree entering water temperature. It would tell us the performance should be 40,100 BTUs. So as long as we are within 10% of what's in the manual, there's no need to put your refrigerant gauges on the system there's no need to do anything else as far as looking at the refrigerant side because the unit's performing all that it can. And we have examples here that we will definitely go through 
Uh, I've got like four examples. We'll go through all those together uh, so you can get a little bit better understanding of how to do the calculations. Here's our first practice exercise. Again, we do list CFM ratings or what it should be outputting, and uh, you can definitely look at that. I don't know. I, Personally, in tech support, I don't look at that very often unless maybe I've got a real low temperature difference, but the heat of extraction turned out okay, because uh, maybe we're moving too much airflow. Uh, but we're gonna assume 1600 CFM, and we're always gonna assume that you're in full load. Here we have a YT-048. So we'll go to the unit and Personally, I don't care if you check temperature difference first or pressure drop first. Whatever you feel more comfortable doing, whatever tool you have in your hand first is fine with me. It's not gonna change things. Uh, we're gonna start with checking pressure drop first. So we'll take our entering water pressure of 49 and we're leaving at 46. So we just do the math on that. 49 minus 46 is three PSI. Go ahead, while you're there, do your temperature difference. We're gonna tell you we have 53 and a half degrees in and 44.6 degree out. So if we look at this, we have 53 in, 44.6 out. You have to look at that and say, am I in heating or cooling? Well, since we're the entering water temperature is greater than the leaving water temperature, we know that we're extracting heat from that loop field from this heat exchanger and putting it into the refrigerant circuit. So we're extracting from the loop field. If it was reversed, we have 44.6 in and 53.5 out. We're picking up heat in this heat exchanger and rejecting it into the loop field. So we're in heating mode. We have 8.9 degree temperature difference. So I'll let you know we're in heating mode. We're, we have methanol in the system. So our brine factor is 485 because we have antifreeze in it. Anytime there's antifreeze, use the 485. Now, we found our PSI pressure drop, but that's not GPM. Don't put that in a little GPM space there. That's the uh, pressure drop. So we take that three GPM, or excuse me, that three PS high and look at our entering water temperature of 53 and a half. That's when we need to look at this manual. We're not gonna have a 53 degree water temperature, entering water temperature on the right. So 50 degrees is close enough, close enough for what we're doing here. So 50 degree entering water temperature and we had a three pound pressure drop. So we look at the PSI column right there and follow that down 2.9 that's close enough I mean 0.1 I'm not gonna uh, split hairs here that's pretty close that tells us we have 9 GPM so that's minimum flow rate for a closed loop system so we know it's 9 we need to write that number down as our GPM oh kind of slid over right we change these slides up a little bit to the widescreen and uh, sometimes it throws off our numbers there. I have to make a quick, quick note to uh, change that. Our delta T or our temperature difference was 8.9. So now we have all the numbers that we need to calculate the heat of extraction. Run the formula, nine GPM times our temperature difference of 8.9 times our brine factor or our fluid factor, or whatever you want to call it, uh, the antifreeze mixture of 485. Pretty easy to do that math. That comes out to 38,848 BTUs. Again, that's just a number. Now we need to compare that back to the chart in the manual. We had 38.8, we come back down to the 50 degree entering water temperature, nine GPM, 
we did have 1600 CFM, so you can follow that 1600 CFM line. Find the HE, not the HC, the HE, heat of extraction. Follow that down to the 1600 crosses. Tells us we should have 39,600 at 39.6 means 39,600. So we measured 38A. The manual was at 39.6. So 10% of 39.6 would be about 4,000 BTUs off of that. So we could go down to about 35,000 BTUs uh, and still be within uh, spec. Well, we're at 38.8. So we're within that 10% plus or minus. So is the unit operating properly? Yes, it sure is. There's no need to put your refrigerant gauges on there the unit's operating, it's doing all the work that it possibly can. So we'll go through a couple more of these. And before I forget, I wanna let you know that this video or this webinar is recorded today. And at the end of the day, or maybe this afternoon, uh, after lunch or something, this will be, uh, they'll send the video to us, so go to webinar, we'll send it to us and then we will upload it to our YouTube channel. And you can go there and you can watch it uh, anytime you want. There's actually a link on the Geothermal University website and it'll take you right to all of our training videos uh, on our YouTube channel. All the past webinars that we've done uh, are on there. So you can feel free to watch any of them that you want, they're all free. And if you have, get, if you watch those, have questions during or after, give me a call. Give tech support a call, and we'll uh, we'll we'll help you out. So I just wanted to re let you guys know that this will be recorded, so you can go back and look at it again if you need to. So in this exercise, we're going to assume that's 1950 CFM. Obviously, we're in full load, second stage. Always check the unit in second stage. Easiest way to tell if a unit is in second stage is amp draw. Sometimes you can actually hear the compressor change tones. Uh, and you can also look at your, your refrigerant gauges. Your pressures will be higher in first stage than they will in second. But if you put an amp meter on the compressor and you remove the low voltage harness on the compressor, you should see an amp draw change of about three to five amps. So that way you can confirm that it's in second stage. Now in this system, we're on straight water. So our brine factor for straight water is 500. So that's what we're gonna end up putting in the, uh, in the brine factor column there. Here is an XTO 60, so a five ton unit. We have entering water pressure of 23 and a half and leaving at 21, so we have a two and a half pound pressure drop, which is pretty normal uh, for a system. The smaller the unit gets, seems like the lower the pressure drop. So that's why these digital pressure gauges are, are pretty important. If you don't have one, you're gonna have to kind of do a little bit of uh, figuring out a little bit more because it's going to bounce on an analog gauge. It'll bounce a little bit on the digital pressure gauge as well. Uh, so you're going to have to find the happy medium where it kind of settles down at. But this example, two and a half PSI pressure drop. Next, since you're right there at the pressure temperature ports, go ahead and use your thermometer and check temperature difference. We have 48.7 degree in and 67.9 degree out. So we just do the math and that's a 19.2 degree temperature difference. Now, you can see that we the entering water temperature is hot is lower than the leaving water temperature. So that tells us that we're picking up heat from the home and we're going to reject it into the loop field. So we're in cooling mode. So we're in cooling mode. Our brine factor for water is 500. We had a pressure drop of 2.5. So now we need to go ahead and 
look at our at the manual again. Our entering water temperature is 48.7. So we come over to the chart. <clears throat> Remember to look in the full load. And 50 degree is the closest we have. <clears throat> so 50 degree entering water temperature, we had a 2.5 pound pressure drop. So 2.6, actually that needs to be slid over to uh, 2.6 pound pressure drop would equal 7.5 GPM. So now we know our GPM, our delta T was 19.2. So now we just run the calculation. We have all the numbers that we need. 7.5, which is our GPM, multiplied by our temperature difference of 19.2, times our fluid factor or brine factor. Remember, water is 500. Straight water is 500. So 7.5 times 19.2 times 500 equals 72,000 BTUs. So next, we will go ahead. We've got the manual open. We'll go ahead and look in there. 50 degree entering water, 7.5 GPM. We were at 1950 CFM. So we follow that down. Actually, it's supposed to be 80,000.4. So 80,400 BTUs. We measured 72,000. So 10% of 80,400 BTUs is about 72,000. 400, I, I'm not, there's a little numbers after that. So, or actually 71,600 BTUs. So we're within specs, but we're right on the line on this unit. Now, it could be maybe we're actually moving a little bit more GPM or maybe our temperature difference is a little bit higher than that. Regardless, on something like this, I probably have to look at and see why I was called to the job. Am I just there for like a service call, just a normal maintenance? Uh, if so, then I probably really wouldn't do anything. If you're there because maybe it's not keeping up, then you may want to dig into a little bit deeper or just make a note on your ticket to make sure to check it next time you're there to see if that's gotten outside of that 10%. Because right now you're about 9%. Uh, off of that capacity. So you're right on the verge of being outside of the specs. So you kind of have to look at why you're there. And, uh, you know, if you're, just, again, just there for service work, maintenance, normal maintenance, then I would probably just make a note on the ticket to check it again next time you're out there. But it is actually within specs. But it's just on the line there. We'll go through another exercise here. This is the YT unit. The YT unit is our uh, newest packaged unit. It's probably the most common packaged unit now. Uh, I really like the YT. It's proven to be uh, very reliable and uh, we've had good luck with it. So I like some of the little features like the, the switch on the side of the, the superheater is nice to um, get in there and uh, turn it off. And um, uh, it's just a nice unit. So we're at 1240 CFM in a full load compressor. Our brine is glycol, propylene glycol. Uh, so anytime we're using antifreeze, make sure that our brine factor is 485. So start off with pressure drop, 18 PSI in, 15 PSI out. Three pound pressure drop. Next, we'll move on to our temperature difference. We have 30 degree in and 26.9 degree out. So a 3.2 degree temperature difference. Now you can see our entering water temperature is higher than our leaving water temperature. So that would tell us that we're extracting heat from the water and putting it into the home. So we're in a heating mode. We're in heating mode, 
brine factor for glycol, 485. PSI pressure drop of three. So we know our entering water temperature is 30. We need to look it up in the chart. 30 degree entering water temperature, three pound pressure drop. 3.2, that's that's pretty close. Uh, I'm fine with using that number. That tells us we're, we're at nine GPM or the recommended flow rate on a closed loop system. So now we know our GPM, we know our delta T of 3.2. So now we can do the calculation. Take our GPM of nine times our temperature difference of 3.2 times our brine factor of 485. That gives us 13,968 BTUs. Doesn't really sound that great, does it? Not on a three ton unit. So again, we go back to the chart, 30 degree entering water temperature at nine GPM and 1240 CFM. 22,700 BTUs. So 10% off of 22,700 would be about Little bit, a little bit under 20,000 BTUs. So we measured 13.9 and we're at 20, we should be near 22. We are not within specs. Now, as you do more and more geo and you're out there working on them more and more, you'll start to see temperature differences. Uh, if you've got proper flow rates, you'll, you'll start to realize, you know, it should be probably somewhere around seven on a closed loop and maybe double that on an open loop. So you could probably, once you saw that 3.2 degree temperature difference, if your GPM is correct, you would probably say, hey, I can already tell you we're low. Uh, now on something like this, it looks like we're moving about two thirds capacity of the unit, which may mean that we're not really in second stage. Because first stage we're running about 67% capacity. So we're not running 50%, it's about 67. So it's very possible that this unit, maybe the second stage solenoid, there's an issue with it, or you're not getting a Y2 call. Uh, so that's probably the first thing I would check on this unit. But once you see these numbers here, we're well without, outside of that 10%, we would wanna go ahead and move forward with doing some diagnostics on the unit because it is not operating properly. We do have a heat of extraction rejection video as well. It's on the YouTube channel uh, and you can certainly watch that. We won't watch it today, but no refrigerant gauges are ever needed to do heat of extraction and heat of rejection. Just make sure you leave those on your truck uh, until you until you know that that's what we need to do. Uh, whenever you're putting refrigerant gauges on there, when I put refrigerant gauges on, I just use uh, a gauge with a small little nipple sticking out so I can thread it on, and then I don't have hoses because I check refrigerant pressures more than uh, you know. I do last site visits, so I, I'll check it. But uh, refrigerant hoses can cause a problem pulling refrigerant out. So uh, there is a video that we have. Uh, you're more than welcome to watch it and you can definitely rehash uh, this training as well on the YouTube channel later on today. So that's all I have. So any questions or comments, uh, we'll open that up and I'll answer as, answer your questions and I'll kind of look through see if we've got any others that I missed here. Uh, hang on one second.
Sorry, I was having a little bit of problem pulling up my little question panel there. So that's all we have. I will call it a day. If you guys need anything, uh, feel free to definitely give us a shout and we'll be more than willing to give you a hand. If you guys want some more training, I am going to post a training today, uh, a little bit later on, uh, on uh, uh, I'm gonna have a superheat subcooling training next week, next Wednesday, uh, same time, probably be just an hour or so. Um, so definitely, uh, you may want to wait till tomorrow and you can definitely look at the our our uh, uh intertech university and sign up for that as well and we'll cover some super neat subcooling calculations and then the week after that maybe some uh, more control type stuff so uh thanks guys i really appreciate your time and uh um, i uh hope you guys have a great week and stay safe out there